your manners that I'm concerned about. Well, we merely pay you the respects you owe. But, Mother, why this hurry? Must you go? I must. This house appalls me. No one in it will pay attention for a single minute. Children, I take my leave much vexed in spirit. I offer good advice, but you won't hear it. Law breaking and chatter on and on. It's like a madhouse with the keeper gone. Uh, uh, Girl, you talk too much. And I'm afraid you're far too saucy for a lady's maid. You push in everywhere and have your say. But you don't You boy it. grow more foolish every day to think my grandson should be such a dunce. I said it a hundred times if I've said it once, that if you keep this path on which you've started, you'll leave your worthy father brokenhearted. I think And so. you, his sister, seem so pure, so shy, so innocent and so demure. But you know what they say about still waters. I pity parents with secretive daughters. And now mother And as for you, child, let me add that your behaviour is extremely bad, and a poor example for these children too. Yeah, dear dead mother did far better than you. You're much too free with money, and I'm distressed to see you so elaborately dressed. When is one's husband the one aims to please? One has no need for costly fripperies. Oh, that's brilliant. You are her brother, sir, and I respect and love you. But if I were my son, this lady's good and pious spouse, I wouldn't make you welcome in my house. You're full of worldly counsels, which I fear aren't suitable for decent folk to hear. I've spoken bluntly, sir, but it behooves us. Not to mince words when righteous father moves us. Your man Tartuffe is full of holy speech. And practice is precisely what he preaches. He's a fine man and should be listened to, and I will not hear him mocked by fools like you. Dear Lord, do you expect me to submit to the tyranny of this copying hypocrite? Must we forgo all our joys and satisfactions because this bigot censures all our actions? To hear him talk, and he talks all the time, there's nothing one can do that's not a crime. He rails at everything, your dear Tartuffe. Whatever he reproves deserves reproof. He's out to save your souls, and all of you must love him, as my son would have you do. No, grandmother, I will not take to such a rascal, even for my father's sake. This is how I feel, and I shall not dissemble. His every action makes me seethe and tremble with helpless anger, and I do not doubt that he and I will surely have it out. Surely it's a shame and a disgrace to see this man usurp the master's place. To see this beggar who, when first he came, had neither shoe nor shoestring to his name, so far forget himself that he behaves as if this were his house and we his slaves. Well, mark my words, your souls would fare far better if you obeyed his precepts to the letter. You see him as a saint. I'm far less odd. In fact, I see right through him. He's a fraud! Nonsense! His man Laurent's the same, or worse. I'd not trust either for the penny purse. I can't say what his servant's morals may be. His own great goodness I can guarantee. You are regards him with his taste and fear because he tells you what you loathe to hear, condemns your sins, points out your moral flaws, and humbly strives to further heaven's cause. If sin is all that bothers him, why is it he so upset and folk drop in to visit? Is heaven so outraged by a social call that he must prophesy against us all? I'll tell you what I think. If you ask me, he shows my mistress's company. Rubbish! He's not alone, child, in complaining of all your promiscuous entertainment. While the whole neighborhood's upset, I know by all those carriages that come and go, with crowds of guests parading in and out, and noisy servants loitering about. In all of this, I'm sure there's nothing vicious. But why give people cause to be suspicious? They need no cause. They'll talk in any case. Madame, this world would be a joyless place if, fearing what malicious tongues might say, we locked our doors and turned our friends away. And even if one did so dreary a thing, do you think those tongues would cease their chattering? No, you can't fight slander. It's a losing battle. Let us instead ignore their tittle-tattle and live by conscience clear decrees and let gossips gossip as they please. But there's talk against us, I know the source. It's Daphne and her little husband, of course. For those who have greatest cause for guilt and shame are the quickest to besmirch a neighbor's name. When there's a chance for libel, they never miss it. When something can be made to seem illicit, the prophet wants to spread the joyous news, adding to fact what fantasies they choose. By talking up their neighbors' indiscretions, they seek to camouflage their own transgressions. 
hoping that others' innocent affairs will lend a hue of innocence to theirs. That is all quite irrelevant. I tell you that you are blessed to have Tartu, dwelling as my son's guest beneath this roof. That heaven has sent him to forestall its wrath by leading you once more to the true path. Huh? That all he reprehends is reprehensible, and that you'd better heed him and be sensible. These visits, balls, and parties in which you all revel are nothing, nothing but inventions of the devil. Whenever he has a word that's edifying, as much chaff and foolishness and lying, as well as vicious gossip in which one's neighbor is cut to bits with epe, oil, and sabre. Whenever he, people of sense are driven half insane at such affairs where noise and folly reign and reputation perish thick and fast. As a wise preacher said on Sunday last, parties are nothing but towers of Babylon because they guess all oh, Babylon would never pause. And then he told a story which I think I had that laugh, sir, and I saw that wink. Go find your silly friends and laugh some more. Enough! I'm going! Don't show me the door! I leave this house that's just made in vest, and I cannot say when I shall see you next. Wake up! Don't sit there gaping in his face! I'll slap him sit in that stupid face! Move, move, you troller! I think I'll stay behind. I want no farther pieces of her mind. How that poor lady... Oh, and wouldn't she say if she could hear you speak of her that way? she thank you for the lady. I'm sure she found the old bit premature. Oh, what a scene she made. What a din. How that man Tartuffe has taken her in. Yes, but her son is even worse deceived. His folly must be seen to be believed. In the late troubles he played an able part and served as king with wise and loyal heart. But he's quite since lost his senses since he fell beneath Tartuffe's infatuating spell. He calls him brother and loves him as his life, preferring him to mother, child, or wife. In him and him alone will he confide. He's made him his confessor and his guide. He pets and pampers him with love more tender than any pretty mistress could engender. Stuffs him with dainties till his guts descend, and when he belches cries, God bless you, friend. In short, he's mad. He worships him, he dotes, his deeds he marvels at, his words he quotes. And Tartuffe, pleased to find so easy a victim, has in a hundred ways beguiled and tricked him, milked him of money, and established him with his permission a sort of inquisition. He sermonizes us in thundering tones. He confiscates our ribbons and colognes. Last week, he tore a kerchief into pieces because he found it pressed into a life of Jesus. He said it's a sin to juxtapose unholy vanities and holy prose. Oh, you did well not to follow. She stood in the door and said verbatim all she said before. I saw my husband coming. I think I'd best go upstairs now and take a little rest. Oh, wait, the grease up here. And I must go. I really only time to say hello. Sound up about my sister's wedding, please. I think Tartuffe's against it, and he's been urging my father to withdraw his blessing. As you may know, I find this most distressing. Unless Valère and my sister can marry, my hopes to wed his sister will miscarry. And I'm determined. He's coming! Ah, oh, brother. Good day. Welcome, pack, brother. I'm sorry I can't stay. How is the country? Filming, I trust. I'm green. Excuse me, brother, just one moment. Doreen, to put my mind at ease, I always learn the household news the moment I return. Has all been well these two days I've been born? How are the family? What's been going on? Well, your wife, two days ago, had a bad fever and a fierce headache which refused to leave her. Ah, and Tartuffe? Tartuffe? Why, he's round and red, bursting with health and excellently fed. Poor fellow. Well, at night the mistress was quite unable to take a single bite at the dinner table. Her headache pain, she said, was simply Hellish. Ah, oh. and Tartuffe? He ate his meal with relish and devoured in her presence a leg of mutton and a brace of pheasants. Poor fellow! Well, the pains continued strong and she tossed and tossed all night long. Now icy cold and burning as a flame, we stayed by her bedside till morning came. Ah, oh. and Tartuffe? <laughs> Why, having eaten, he rose and saw his room all ready with doze got into his warm head and snored away in perfect peace until the break of day. Poor fellow! 
After much ado, we talked her in dispatching someone for the doctor. He bled her and her fever quickly fell. Ah, and our team? <laughs> he bore it very well. And to keep his cheerfulness at any cost and make up for the blood Madame had lost, he drank at lunch four beakers full of port. Poor fellow! They are both doing well in short, and I shall go tell Madame that you've expressed keen sympathy and anxious interest. <laughs> that girl was laughing in your face. And though I wish not to offend you even so, I'm bound to say she had some excuse. How could you possibly be such a goose? Are you so dazed by this man's hocus pocus? that the whole world, save him, is out of focus? You've given him food, shelter, clothing, and care. Why must you also- Brother, stop right there! You do not know the man of whom you speak! I'll grant you that, but my judgment's not so weak that I can't tell by his effect on others. Ah, oh, when you meet him, you two should be like brothers. There's been no loftier soul since time began. He is a man who... A man who... An excellent man! To keep his precepts is to be reborn and view this dunghill of a world with scorn. Yes, I'm a changed man indeed. Under his tutelage, my soul has been freed from every human love and earthly tie. Yes, my mother, brother, children, and wife could die, and I'd not feel a single moment's pain. That's a fine sentiment, brother. Most humane. Ah, if you had met Tartuffe when I first knew him, your heart, like mine, would have surrendered to him. He used to come into our church each day and humbly kneel nearby and start to pray. He'd draw the eyes of everybody there with the deep fervor of his heartfelt prayer. He'd sigh and weep, and sometimes with a sound of rapture, he'd bend and kiss the ground. This serving man, no less devout than he, informed me of his master's poverty. I gave him gifts, but in his humbleness, he'd beg me each time to give him less. Oh, that's too much, he'd cry, too much by twice. The half so would suffice. And when I refused to take them back, he'd share half of it with the poor right then and there. At length, heaven prompted me to take him in, to dwell with us and save our souls from sin. He guides our lives and to protect my honor, stays by my wife and keeps an eye upon her. He knows whom she sees and all she does. He's more jealous than I ever was. Good lord, man, have you lost your common sense? Or is this all some joke at my expense? How can you sit there in all some bright? Brother, your language savors of impiety. Too, too much we think he's made your faith unsteady. And as I've told you many times already- well, Spare me your warnings, brother. I have no fear to speak out for you or heaven to hear against affected zeal and pious debris. There's true and false in piety as in bravery. There's a vast difference, it seems to me, between true piety and hypocrisy. How do you fail to see it, I ask? Is a face not quite different from a mask? Are scarecrows just as men, and do you hold that a false coin is as good as gold? Ah, brother, man's a strangely fashioned creature, who seldom seems content to follow nature, but instead recklessly pursues his every inclination, beyond the narrow bounds of moderation. And often by transgressing, and offense by transgressing reason's laws perverts a lofty aim on noble cause. A passing observation, but it applies. I see, dear brother, that you are profoundly wise. You harbor all the insight of the age. You are our house's one clear mind. It's only sage, and all mankind are fools compared to you. Heavy, brother, I do not claim to be a sage, nor do I have all the wisdom of the age. There's just one insight I would dare to make. I know that true and false are not the same. And just as there's nothing I more cherish and admire than honest zeal and true religious fire, so there's nothing I find more base than specious piety's dishonest face, worn by calculating souls who offer up prayers not to heaven, but as public wares, who seek to buy rank and reputation with lifted eyes and sighs of exultation. These charlatans who weep, pray, swindle, and extort who preach the monkish life but haunt the court, who make their zeal a partner in their vice, such men are vengeful, sly, and cold as ice. And these names are all too common nowadays, but for the wise, true piety isn't hard to recognize. 
Happily, these present days provide us with many great examples to instruct and guide us. Can men whose virtue is acknowledged by all, and who know that eventually all people fall, and so it's not their way to criticize or chide, and they think in seriousness a mark of pride. They think no evil of their fellow man, but judge him as kindly as they can. These men I honor, these men I advocate, as examples for us all to emulate. Your man's not their sort, I fear. And while your praise from is quite sincere, I'm afraid you've been dreadfully denuded. Now then, dear brother, is your speech concluded? Why, yes. Your servant, sir. Ah, oh, brother, wait. There's one more matter. You agreed of late that young Blair might have your daughter's hand. I did. And set the date, I understand. Quite so. How you postponed it. No is doubt. Is that true? No doubt. The match no longer pleases you. I won't say that. Do you plan to go back on your word? Perhaps. Has anything happened that might entitle you to break your pledge? Maybe. Come, brother, why must you hear and haul around the hedge? Do you plan to keep your word or not? It's been a pleasure. But what shall I tell the mayor? Are you still- I plan, sir, to be guided by heaven's will. Come, brother, talk, talk, rock. Do you plan to keep your word or not? Good day. Here's the poor for mayor's undoing. I'll go tell him that there's trouble brewing. <coughs> Eavesdroppers, dear. I'm making sure we shan't be overheard. Someone in there could catch our every word. Ah, oh, good, we're safe. Now, Marianne, my child, you're a sweet girl who's tractable and mild, whom I hold dear and think most fondly of. I'm deeply grateful, Father, for your love. That's well said, and you can repay me if, in all things, you cheerfully obey me. To please you, sir, is what delights me best. Good, good. Now what do you think of Tartuffe, our guest? I, sir? Yes. Where your answer. Think it through. Why, I'll say whatever you wish me to. That's wisely said, my daughter. Then say of him that he's the very worthiest of men, that you're fond of him and would rejoice in being his wife, if that should be my choice. Well? What? What's that? I... Well? Forgive me, pray. Did you not hear me? Of whom, so must I say? And would rejoice in being his wife if that be your choice? Why of Tartuffe? Oh, but father, that's false, you know. Why would you have me say anything with the answer? Because I'm resolved it shall be true, that it's my wish should be enough for you. You can't mean, father. Yes, Tartuffe is to be allied by marriage to this family, and he's to be your husband. Is that clear? It's a father's privilege. <laughs> what are you doing here? Is curiosity so fierce a passion with you that you must eavesdrop in this fashion? There's no sleep in a plumer going about. Pay some, some, hunch or chance mark, no doubt. That you mean Marianne to wed Tartuffe. I've laughed it off, of course, it's just a spoof. You find it so incredible? Yes, I do. I won't accept that story, even from you. You'll believe it when the thing is done. Yes, yes, go on and have your fun. I've never been more serious in my life. <laughs> Daughter, I mean it. You're to be his wife. No, don't listen to your father. It's all a hoax. See here, young woman. Come, sir, no more jokes. You can't fool us. How dare you talk that way? All right, we believe you. Sad to say. But a man like you who looks so wise and wears a moustache of such... Splendid size could be so foolish as to silence, please, my girl. You take too many liberties. I'm master here, as you must not forget. <clears throat> Do let's discuss this calmly. Don't be upset. But sir, you can't be serious about this plan. What would that bigot want with Marianne? Praying and fasting ought to keep him busy. And then, in terms of wealth and rank, what is he? Why should a man of property like you? Pick out a beggar son-in-law. That will do! <coughs> Speak of his poverty with reverence. He is a pure and saintly indigence, which far transcends all worldly pride and pelf. He lost his fortune, as he says himself, because he cared for heaven alone, and so was careless of his interests here below. I mean to get him out of his present state, and help him to recover his estate, which, 
in his part of the world, have no small faith. Poor though he is, he is a gentleman just the same. Yes, so he tells us. But, sir, it seems to me that such pride goes very ill with piety. A man whose spirit spurns this dungy earth, or not a brag of lands and noble birth, such arrogance will hardly square with meek devotion and the life of prayer. But this approach I see has drawn a blank. Let's speak that in his person, not his rank. Sir, doesn't it seem to you a trifle grim to give a girl like her to a man like him? But <laughs> you are so ill suited. Can't you see what the sad consequence is bound to be? A young girl's virtue is imperiled, sir, when such a marriage is imposed on her. For if one's bridegroom is not to one's taste, it's hardly an inducement to be chaste. <laughs> it's hard to be a faithful wife, in short, to certain husbands of a certain sort. <laughs> and he who gives his daughter to a man she hates, but adds up for her sins at heaven's gates. Think, sir, before you play so risky a role. This silly girl presumes to save my soul. You do well to ponder what I said. Daughter, we'll disregard this dunderhead. Oh, I'm aware that I once promised you to young Valet, but now I hear he gambles, which greatly shocks me. What's more, I have doubts about his orthodoxy. His visits to church, I note, are very few. Would you have him go at the same hours as you and kneel nearby to be sure of being seen? I can dispense with such remark stories. Tartuffe, however, is sure of heaven's blessing, and that's the only treasure worth possessing. This match shall bring your joys beyond all measure. Your cup shall overflow with every pleasure. You two shall interchange your loves like two sweet cherubs or two turtle doves. No harsh words shall be heard. No frown be seen, and he shall make you happy as a queen. And don't interrupt me further! Why can't you learn that certain things are none of your concern? It's for your sake, sir, that I interfere. Most kind of you. Now hold your tongue, do you hear? If I didn't love you... Spare me your affection! I'll love you, sir, in spite of your objection! Blast! I cannot, for your honor's sake, sir, that you make this ludicrous mistake! If you don't hold your tongue, you little shrew! What? Lost your temper? A pious man like you? Yes! Yes! You talk and talk! I'm maddened by it! Once and for all, I tell you to be quiet! Well, I'll be quiet. But I'll be thinking hard. <laughs> Think all you like, but you had better guard that saucy tongue of yours or I'll... <sighs> Now, Marianne, I've weighed this matter fully. Oh, it has more hand that I cannot speak. Tartuffe is no young dandy, but still, his person is as sweet as candy. It's such that even if you shouldn't care for his other merits, they'll make a perfect pair. If I was she, no man would marry me against my inclination and go scot free. He'd find out before the wedding day was over how readily a wife can find a lover. It seems you treat my orders as a joke. Why, what's the matter? It was not to you I spoke. <laughs> what were you doing? Talking to myself, that's all. Ah, one more bit of impudence and girl, and I shall give her a good slap in the face. Now, Marianne, your marriage, your wedding day, why don't you talk to yourself? I have nothing to say. Come, <laughs> just one word. No, thank you, sir. I haven't any. Come, speak. I'm waiting. I'd not be such a ninny. <sighs> In short, dear daughter, I mean to be obeyed, and you must bow to the sound choice I've made. I've not wed such a monster, even in jest. <laughs> that maid of yours is a thorough pest. She has me sinfully annoyed and nettled. I can't speak further. My nerves are too unsettled. I'll calm myself by going for a walk.
were sincere. I don't believe in everything I hear. They were, and you do me wrong to doubt it. Heaven knows I've been all too frank about it. You love him then? Oh, more than I can express. And he, I take it, cares for you no less? I think so. And you both with equal fire burn to be married? That is our one desire. What a part you've been. What of your father's plan? Oh, I'll kill myself if I'm forced to wed that man. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, of course. How splendid! Just die and all your troubles will be ended. <laughs> a fine solution. Oh, how it matters me if you talk in that self-pitying key. Doreen, it's most unfair. You have no sympathy for my despair. I've none at all for those who talk drivel and face with difficulties whine and snivel. No doubt I'm timid, but it would be very wrong to... True love requires a heart that's firm and strong. I'm strong in my affection for Valère. Coping with my father is his affair. But if your father's brain has grown so cracked at his dear Tartu, then he can attract his blessing. Though your wedding day was named, surely it's not Valère who's to be blamed. If I defy my father, as you suggest, would it not seem unmaidenly at best? Shall I defend my love at the expense of brazenness and disobedience? Shall I parade my heart's desires and flaunt oh, around? No, I ask nothing of you. Clearly you want to be Madame Tartuffe. And I feel bound not to oppose a wish so very sound. Who am I to criticize the match? Indeed, the man's a brilliant catch. <laughs> the world already rings with his renown. He's a great noble in his native town. <laughs> His ears are red, he has a pink complexion, and all in all, he'll suit you to perfection. Oh, dear Lord! Oh, how victorious you'll feel in having brought a husband. So ideal. Doreen, stop teasing and use your cleverness to get me out of this appalling mess. No, a dutiful daughter must obey her father, even if he weds her to an ape. You <laughs> and pride future, why struggle to escape? Tartuffe will take you back to where his family lives. A small town will swarm with relatives. Uncles and cousins, you'll be charmed to meet. You'll be greeted at once by the elite. Calling upon the bailiff's wife, no less. Even perhaps upon the mayoress, who'll sit you down in the best kitchen chair. And once a year, you'll dance at the village fair. To the drone of bagpipes, too, in fact. And you'll see a puppet show, or an animal act. Your husband... Oh, you turn my blood to ice. Stop teasing and give me your advice. Your servant, madame. Doreen, I beg of you. No. You deserve it. This marriage must go through. Doreen! No, not Tartuffe. You know what I think of him. Tartuffe's your cup of tea, and you shall drink him. I've always told you everything and relied on you. No, you deserve to be tartuffe <laughs> Well, since you mock me and refuse to care, I'll henceforth seek my solace in despair. Despair shall be my counselor and my friend, and help me bring my sorrows to an end. <laughs> oh, come back. My anger has subsided. You do deserve some pity, I've decided. Now, don't fret. It won't be difficult to discover some plan of action. Ah, but here's Valet, your lover. Madame, I've just received some wondrous news regarding which I'd like to hear your views. What news? You're marrying Tartuffe. Fine, the father does have such a match in mind. Your father, madame? He just this minute said that it's Tartuffe he wishes me to wed. Can he be serious? Oh, indeed he can. He's clearly set his heart upon the plan. And what position do you propose to take, madame? Why, I don't know. For heaven's sake, you don't know? No. Well, well. You advise me do. Marry the man. That's my advice to you. <laughs> That's your advice? Yes. Truly? Oh, absolutely. You couldn't choose more wisely, more astutely. Well, thanks for this counsel. I'll follow it, of course. Do, do. I'm sure it will cost you no remorse. To give it didn't cause your heart to break. I gave it, madame, only for your sake. And it's for your sake that I take it. Sir, let's see which fool proved the stubborner. So, I'm nothing to you, and it was flat please, as such Please, please, enough of that. You told me plainly that I should agree to wed the man my father's chosen for me. And since you deign to counsel me so wisely, I promise, sir, to do as you advise me. Ah, oh, no, it was not by me that you were swayed. No, your decision was already made. Though to save appearances, you prote protest that you were betraying me at my behest. <laughs> Just as you say. Quite so. And now I see that you were never truly 
in love with me. <laughs> Alas, you are free to think so if you choose. I choose to think so. Here's a bit of news. You spurned my hand, but now I know where to turn for kinder treatment, as you shall quickly learn. Your noble qualities inspire affection. Forget my qualities, please. They don't inspire you over much, I find. But there's another lady I have in mind, whose sweet and generous nature will not scorn, but compensate me for the loss of born. Well, I'm sure you'll transfer your heart quite painlessly from me to her. I'll do my best to take it in my stride, the pain I feel being cast aside. Time and forgiveness may put it into, or if I can't forget, I shall pretend to. No self-respecting person is expected to go on loving once it's been rejected. Now that's a fine, high-minded sentiment. One to which any sane man would assent. Would you prefer that I pined away in hopeless passion to my dying day? Might I yield you to a rival's arms and so myself with other charms? Go then! Console yourself! Don't hesitate! Indeed! I cannot wait! You wish me to? Yes! That's the final straw. Madame, farewell. Your wish shall be my love. Splendid. <laughs> Remember that this breach is of your making. It's you who drew me to the step I'm taking. I see that, clearly. <laughs> Remember, too, that I'm merely following your example. Obviously. Enough! I'll go and do your bidding, then. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'll never see my face again. Excellent. <laughs> yes? What? What's that? What did you say? Nothing. You're dreaming. Ah, well, I'm on my way. But, um, farewell. <laughs> farewell. Oh, if you ask me, both of you are mad as mad can be. I won't let you squabble so long and see where I would get you. Oh, oh then, Monsieur Boulet. What's this, Doreen? Come here. No, no, my heart's too full of spleen. Don't <laughs> hold me back. Her wish must be obeyed. Oh, stop! It's too late now. My decision's been made. Oh, he hates the sight of me, that's plain. I'll go and so deliver him from pain. And now you run away. Come back. Oh, no, let go! <laughs> she can't bear my presence, I perceive. Spare her further torment. I shall leave. Again, you're not escaped, sir. Don't you try it. Come here, you two. Stop fussing and be quiet. We're going to have a little armistice. Now, weren't you silly to get so overheated? Didn't you see how badly I was treated? And weren't you a simpleton who had lost your head? Didn't you hear the hateful things he said? You're both great fools. Her sole desire was to be yours in marriage. To that I'll swear. He loves only you, Marianne, and wants no wife but you. On that I'll stake my life. Then why you advise me to do so? I cannot see. On such a question, why ask advice of me? Oh, you're impossible. Give me your hand, you two. Yours first. But why? Now a hand from you. What is the point of this? <laughs> there. The perfect fit. You two suit each other better than you'll admit. <laughs> don't come. Don't be so haughty. Give a man a look of kindness, won't you, Marianne? I tell you, lovers are completely mad. Now come, confess that you were very bad to hurt my feelings as you did just now. I have a just complaint you must allow. And you must allow that you were most unpleasant. Let's table that discussion for the present. Your father has a plan which must be stopped. Advise us then. What means must we adopt? We we'll use all manners of means, and all at once. Your father's adult. He's acting like a dunce. Therefore, you better humor the old fossil. Pretend to yield to him, be sweet and docile, and then postpone as often as necessary the day on which you agree to marry. You'll thus gain time, and time will turn the trick. Sometimes, for instance, you'll be taken sick, and that will seem good reason for delay, or some bad home will make you change the day. You'll dream of muddy water, or pass a dead man's hearse, or break a looking glass. If all else fails, no man can marry you unless you take his ring and say, I do. But now, let's separate. They should find us talking and our part might be divine. Go and tell your friends what's occurred and get them to urge her father to keep his word. Meanwhile, we'll stir her brother into action and get Almir as well to join our faction. Goodbye. Though each of us will do his best, it's on your heart in which my true hope shall rest. No matter what father may decide, none but Valet shall claim me as his bride. Oh, how these words content me, come what will. <laughs> oh, love us, love us, their tongues are 
never still. Be off now. One last word. No time to chat. You need by this door, and you by that. May lightning strike me as I speak. May all men call me cowardly and weak. If fears and scruples hold me back from settling things at once with that great crack. Now, don't give way to violent emotion. Your father's merely talked about the notion, and words and heeds are far from being one. Much that is talked about is left undone. No! I must stop that scoundrel's machinations. I'll go and tell him off. I'm out of patience. Do calm down and be practical. I'd rather my mistress dealt with him, and with your father. She has some influence with Tartuffe, I've noted. He hangs upon her words and seems most devoted. May indeed be smitten by her charm. Pray heaven is true, for two our gars no harm. She sent for him just now, a sound matter about this affair you're so incensed about. She'll find out where he stands and tell him too what terrible strife and trouble will ensue if he lends countenance to your father's plan. I couldn't get in to see him, but his man says he's almost finished with his prayers. Go now, they'll catch him when he comes downstairs. I must hear this conference, and I will. No, they must be alone. Oh, I'll keep still. Not you, I know your temper. You'd start a brawl and shout and stamp your foot and spoil it all. Be off now. I won't. I have a perfect right. Oh, you're a nuisance. He's coming, he's out of sight. Hang up my hair shirt and put my scourge in place. And pray, Laurent, for heaven's perpetual grace. I'm going to the prison now to share my last few coins with the poor witches there. Dear, dear Lord, what affectation, what a thing! Do you wish to see me? No, I must be on my way. I've just one little message to convey. Madame is coming down and she begs you, sir, to wait and have a word or two with her. Gladly. <laughs> that had a softening effect. Will she be long? No, that's the step I hear. Ah, here she is and I shall disappear. May heaven, whose infinite goodness we adore, preserve your body and soul forevermore. I thank you for that pious wish, but please, do take a chair and let's be more at ease. I trust that you are once more well and strong. Oh yes, the finger didn't last long. My prayers are too unworthy, I'm sure, to have gained from heaven this most Gracious cure. But lately, madame, ma every supplication has had for object your recuperation. Oh, you shouldn't have troubled, so I don't deserve it. Your health is priceless, madame. And to preserve it, I would gladly give my own in all sincerity. Sir, you outdo us all in Christian charity. You've been most kind. I count myself your debtor. Twas nothing, madame. I long to serve you better. <laughs> there's a private matter I'm anxious to discuss. I'm glad there's no one here to hinder us. I too am glad. <laughs> it blows my heart with bliss to find myself alone with you like this. For just this chance, I prayed with all my power. But prayed in vain until this happy hour. This won't take long, sir, and I hope you'll be entirely frank and unconstrained with me. <laughs> Indeed, there's nothing I'd rather do than bear my inmost heart and soul to you. First, let me say that about the remarks I paid, <clears throat> about the constant visits you have paid, were prompted not by any mean emotion, but rather by a pure and deep devotion. A fervent zeal. Oh, no need for explanation. Your sole concern, I'm sure, is my salvation. Quite so, and such great fervor do I feel. Oh, please, you're pinching. Twas from excess of zeal. I never meant to cause you pain, I swear. I'd rather. What can your hand be doing there? I was feeling your gown, madame. What soft, fine woven stuff. Please. Please, I'm extremely ticklish. That's enough. Man, man, what lovely lace work on your dress. The workman seems miraculous, no less. I've not seen anything to equal it. Huh, yes, quite. But let's talk business for a bit. They say my husband means to break his word and give his daughter to you. Had you heard? He did once mention it. But I confess, I dream of quite a different happiness. It's elsewhere, madame, that my eyes. <coughs> 
discern the promise of bliss for which I yearn. I see. You care for nothing here below. Ah, well, my heart's not made of stones, you know. All your desires mount heavenward, I'm sure, in scorn of everything that's earthly and impure. A love of heaven and beauty does not preclude a proper love for earthly perpetuity. Our senses are quite rightly captivated by the perfect works our maker has created. Some glory clings to all that heaven has made, and you, all heaven's marvels are displayed. On that fair face, such beauties have been lavished, the eyes of devil dazzled, and the art is ravished. How can I look on you, O oh, flawless creature, and not adore the author of all nature, feeling a love both passionate and pure for you, this triumph of self-portraiture. At first I trembled, lest that love should be a subtle snare that hell had laid for me. But soon, fair being, I became aware that my deep passion could be made to square with rectitude and with my bounden duty as a man. Surrender to your beauty. <laughs> it is, I know, presumptuous on my part to come to you with this poor offering of my heart. And it is not my merit, heaven knows, but your compassion on which my hopes repose. <laughs> you are my peace, my solace, my salvation. <laughs> on you depends my bliss or desolation. I abide your judgment, and as you think best, I shall be either miserable or blessed. Your declaration is most gallant, sir. But don't you think it has a character? You done best to restrain your passion and to think before you spoke in such a fashion. It ill becomes a pious man like you. I may be pious, but I am human too. With your celestial charm, <clears throat> charms before his eyes, a man is not so power to be wise. I know these words sound strangely coming from me, but I am no angel. No, it's meant to be. Your loveliness I had no sooner seen than you became my soul's unrivaled queen. Before your seraph glance, divinely sweet, my heart's defenses crumbled in defeat. And nothing, fasting, prayer, or tears might do could stay my spirit from adoring you. My eyes, my sighs have told you in the past. What now my lips make bold to say at last. And if in your great goodness you will deign to look upon your slave and ease his pain, if in compassion for my soul's distress you stoop to comfort my unworthiness, I'll raise to you in thanks for that sweet manner an endless hint, an infinite hosanna. Men of my sort love discreetly and one may trust our reticence completely. In short, I offer you, my dear Amir, love without scandal, pleasure without fear. I've heard your well-turned speeches to the end. And what you urge, I clearly apprehend. Aren't you afraid that I may take notion to tell my husband of your warm devotion? And that supposing he were duly told, his feelings toward you might grow rather cold? I know, dear lady, that in your exceeding charity, you will bring yourself to pardon my temerity. <clears throat> and excuse my, my violent affection as human weakness, human imperfection. Some women might do otherwise, perhaps. But I shall be discreet about your lapse. I'll tell my husband nothing of what's occurred if in return you'll give your solemn word to advocate as forcefully as you can the marriage of Belair and Marianne, renouncing all desire to dispossess another of his rightful happiness. No, we're not hushing about this affair. I heard it all in that closet there. Now I have my long-awaited chance to punish his deceit and arrogance, to show my father this clear and shocking proof of the black character of his dear Tartuffe. Ah, oh, no, dummies. I'll be content if he will study to deserve my leniency. I've promised silence. Don't make me break my word. To create a scandal would be too absurd. The good wives laugh off such trifles and forget them. Why should they tell their husband and upset them? 
You have your reasons for taking such a course, and I have mine too, of equal force. To spare him would be insanely wrong. I've swallowed my just wrath for far too long, and watched this bigot bring strife and bitterness into our family life. It's high time that my father be undeceived, and now I have proof that can't be disbelieved. Proof that is furnished from heaven above, it's too good not to take advantage of. This is my chance, and I deserve to lose it. But for one moment, I hesitate to use it. Tell me! I'll do what I think is right. Madam, my heart is bursting with, a, with delight. I'll settle matters without more ado. And here, most opportunely, is my cue. <laughs> Father. <laughs> I'm glad you joined us. <laughs> Let us advise you of some fresh news that doubtless will surprise you. You've just now been repaid with interest for all your loving kindness to our guest. Yes, I surprised him with your wife and saw his whole adulterous offer. Every word. She, with her all too gentle disposition, would not have told you of his horrid proposition. But I thought that I will never set to matters with brazen lettery, and thought that not to tell you would be treachery. And I hold that one husband peace of mind should not be spoiled by tattle of this kind. These are my sentiments, Damis, and I wish you had heeded me and held your peace. Can it be true, this dreadful thing I hear? Yes, for sir. I am a wicked man, I fear. A wretched sinner, oh, depraved and twisted. The greatest villain that has ever existed. My life is one heap of crimes which grows each minute. There's not much foulness and corruption in it. And I perceive that heaven, outraged by me, has chosen this occasion to mortify me. Charge me with any deed you wish to name. I'll not defend myself, but take the blame. Believe what you are told, and drive that tooth like some base criminal from beneath your roof. Yes, drive me hits, and with a parting curse, I shall protest, for I deserve far worse. Ah, you deceitful boy! How dare you try to spoil this man's purity with so foul a lie? What? Are you taken in by this bluff? Did you not enough, hear Enough, you rogue, enough! <laughs> ah, brother, let him speak. You're being unjust. Believe his story. The boy deserves your trust. Why, after all, should you believe me? How can you know what I might do or be? <coughs> so the world takes me. For a man of worth, and truly the most worthless man on earth. Ah, oh, dear brother, that is too much. Have you no heart? Are you hoodwinked by this rascal's art? Be still, you monster! Villain! But silence! Can't you realize that one more word and I shall tear you limb from limb? In God's name, brother! Oh. Don't be harsh with him. I'd rather be tortured at the stake than to see him bear one small scratch for my poor sake. Ingrate! If I must beg you, unbended knee to pardon him. Such goodness cannot be. Now there's true charity. What? You! Villain, be still! I know your motives. I know you wish him ill. Yes, all of you, brother, children, servants, all conspire against him and wish his fall. Employing every shameful trick you can to alienate me from this saintly man. Ah, but the more you seek to draw him away, the more I'll do to keep him. What's more, to spite this household and confound its pride, I'm giving him my daughter as his bride. You'll force Marianne to accept his hand? Yes, and on this very night, do you understand? I shall defy you all and make it clear that I'm the one who gives the orders here. Come, wretch, kneel down and clap his blessed feet and ask pardon for your black deceit. I ask this swindler's pardon? Why, brother, so you insult him and defy your father. The stick of stick! <laughs> no, no, release me, do. Out of my house this minute, be off with you, and never dare set foot in it again. Well, I shall go, but I want go to Go quickly, then. I leave this, I disinherit you. An empty purse is all you'll get from me, except my curse. How he blasphemed you! What a son! Forgive him, Lord, as I've already done. You can't know how it hurts 
when someone tries to blacken me in my dear Frosser's eyes. Aww. The mere thought of it plunges my soul into so dark a mood. I cannot speak. I gasp for breath and feel myself near death. You blacker! Why did I spare you? Why did I tear you up into little pieces on the spot? Compose yourself and don't be hurt, dear friend. These scenes, these dreadful quarrels have got to end. I've much upset your household, and I perceive that the best thing for me will be for me to leave. What are you saying? They're all against me here. They'd have you think me false and insincere. Oh, what of that? Have I stopped believing in you? Their adverse talk will certainly <gasps> continue, and charges which you now repudiate you may find to be credible at a later date. No, brother, never! <gasps> brother, a wife can sway her husband's mind in many a subtle way. No, no! To leave at once is the solution. Thus only I can end the persecution. No, I'll not allow it. You shall remain. Ah, well, it will mean much martyrdom. And pay. <laughs> but if you wish it, uh? enough. So be it. But there's one precaution I feel bound to take. For your dear honor and for our friendship's sake, I shall avoid your wife and keep away. No, you shall not. Whatever they may say, it pleases me to vex them. And for spite, I'd have them see you within day and night. <laughs> What's more, to drive them to despair, I'm making you my only son and heir. On this day, I give to you alone clear deed and title to everything I own. Will you accept my offer, dearest son? In all things, let the will of heaven be done. Poor fellow. Come, let's draw up the deed and watch them burst with disappointed greed. As for who is guilty, I shan't discuss. Let's say it was Tommy's who caused the fuss, and therefore, assuming that you've been ill used by young Demison, groundlessly accused, should you stand there and watch a father make his only son in exile for your sake? Again, I speak frankly, be advised, the whole town, high and low, is scandalized. This, this quarrel must not go on, and my advice is not to push the matter into further crisis. No sacrifice your wrath to card a pub, and help young Demis reclaim his father's love. <clears throat> Alas, for my part I should take great joy in doing so. I've nothing against the boy. I pardon all. I have no resentment. To serve him would afford me much contentment. But heaven's interests will not have it so. If he returns, then I shall have to go. After his conduct so extreme, so vicious, our further intercourse would look suspicious. Why, they'd describe my goodness to him as sort of a bribe. They'd say that out of guilt I made pretense of loving kindness and benevolence. That, fearing my accuser's tongue, <coughs> I strove to buy silence with a show of love. Your reasoning, sir, is badly warped and stretched. And these excuses are most far-fetched. Why do you put yourself in charge of heaven's cause? Does heaven need our help to enforce its laws? No, leave vengeance to the Lord, sir, and why we live on jobs not to punish, but to forgive. Again, yeah. sir, let me say that I have forgiven Damis, and thus obeyed the laws of heaven. But I am not commanded by the Bible to obey one who smears my name with libel. Were well, you commanded, sir, to indulge the whim of poor Horgon? and encourage him in suddenly transferring to your name, a large estate to which you have no claim. It would never occur to those who, knows me, who know me best to think that I acted from self-interest. The, the treasures of this world I quite despise. Their specious glitter does not charm my eyes. And if I resign myself to taking the gift which my dear brother insists on making, I do so only as he well understands. 
this so much wealth fall into wicked hands? And would it not be worse to be accused of swindling than to see that wealth misused? I'm surprised you allowed Orgon to broach this matter and feel no self-reproach. Does, does true religion teach us that lawful heirs may freely be deprived of what is theirs? And if the Lord has told you that in your heart you and Demise must dwell apart, would it not be the decent thing to be to generous and honorable retreat? <clears throat> Sir, I have certain pious duties to attend to. I hope my prompt departure won't offend you. my soul. No human weakness now. I do not present your love for him, but allow your heart free reign. Give him your property, and if that's not enough, take mine from me. He is welcome to my money, take it due, but I pray do not include my person too. Get up! The more you loathe the man and dread him, the more ennobling it will be to wed him. Marry Tartu, and mortify your flesh. Ugh, enough! Don't start that whimpering of flesh. Be still there! Speak when you're spoken to! Not one more bit of impudence out of you. If I may offer a word of counsel here. Brother, in counseling you have no peer. All you advise is forceful, sound, and clever. I don't propose to take it, however. I am amazed and don't know what to say. Your blindness simply takes my breath away. You are indeed bewitched to take no warning from our account of what occurred this morning. Madam, I know a few plain facts, and one is that you're partial to my rascal son. I know the fact that I shall not be shaken. How oh, I marvel at your power to be mistaken. Would it, I wonder, carry any weight if I could show you that our tale is true? Show me? Yes! What? Come, what if I found a way to make the facts as plain as day? Nonsense! Do answer me. Don't be absurd. I'm not asking you to trust a word. Suppose that from some hiding place in here, you learn the whole sad truth by eye and ear. What would you say of your good friend after that? Why, I'd say... Nothing, by Jehovah's friend, can't be true. You've been long too deceived, and I'm quite tired of being disbelieved. Come, let's put my statements to the test, and we shall see the truth made manifest. I'll take that challenge. Now do your uttermost, and we'll see how you make good your empty boast. Send him to me. He's crafty, and maybe hard catch the cunning scoundrel off his guard. No, Emerson men are gullible. Their conceit so blinds them that they're never hard to cheat. Have him come down. Please, leave us for a Pull up this table and get under it. What? It's essential that you be well hidden. Why there? Oh, heavens, just do as you are bidden. I have my plans. We'll soon see how they fare. Under the table now, and once you're there, make sure you're neither seen nor heard. Well, I'll indulge you since I gave my word to see you through this infantile charade. But once it is over, you'll be glad we played. I'm going to act quite strangely now, and you must not be shocked at anything that I do. Whatever I may say, you must excuse as part of that deceit I'm forced to use. 
I shall employ sweet speeches in the task of making that impostor drop his mask. I'll give encouragement to his bold desires and furnish fuel to his amorous fires. And since it's for your sake and his destruction that I shall seem to yield to his seduction, I'll gladly stop whenever you decide that all your doubts are fully satisfied. I'll count on you as soon as you have seen what sort of man he is to intervene. And not expose me to his odious lust one moment longer than you feel you must. Remember, you're to save me from my plight whenever he's coming. Hush. Keep out of sight. You wish to have a word with me, I'm told. Yes, I have a little secret to unfold. Before I speak, however, it would be wise to close that door and look about for spies. thing that must happen now is a repetition of this morning's row. I've never been so badly caught off guard. Oh, how I feared for you. You saw how hard I tried to make that troublesome dummy control his dreadful temper and hold his peace. In my confusion, I simply didn't have the sense to contradict his evidence. But as it happened, that has all worked out for the best. This is only bettered your interest. The storm has only bettered your position. My husband doesn't have the least suspicion. And now, in mockery of those who do, he bids me be continually with you. And that is why, quite fearless of a proof, I can now be alone with my Tartu. Madame, your words confuse me. Not long ago, you spoke in a different style, you know? Ha, ha, sir, if that refusal made you snort, it's little that you know a woman's heart. Or what a heart is trying to convey when it resists in such a feeble way. But always at first, our modesty prevents the frank abound of tender sentiment. However, high the passion which inflames us. Still, to confess that power somehow shames us. Thus we reluct at first, yet in the tone which tells that the heart is overthrown, that what our lips deny, our pulse confesses, in that in time our nose shall turn to yeses. Oh, I fear my words are all too frank and free, and a poor proof of a woman's modesty. But tell me, if you will, when I have tried to make dummies be still, and men so very mild in my reaction, had your sweet words not given me satisfaction? And when I try to force you to undo the marriage plans my husband has in view, but what did my urging pleading signify, if not that I admired you, and I deplore the thought that someone else should own a part of the heart I wish for mine alone? Madame, your words confuse me. I already said that, didn't I? <laughs> I mean to say, no happiness is complete. As when from lips we love come words so sweet. Should to please you is my joy, my only goal. Is your love is a restore of my soul. And yet, I must beg leave now to express some lingering doubts as to my happiness. Might this not be a trick? Might not the catch be that you wish me to break off the match with Marianne and so have feigned to love me? I can't trust this fondness of me until the feelings you've expressed so sweetly are demonstrated somewhat more concretely. <laughs> until you've shown by certain kind concessions that I may begin to put my faith in your profession. Oh, why be in such a hurry? Must my heart exhaust its bounty at the very start? To make that sweet admission cost me dear. But you'll not be content, it would appear, until my show of favours is dispersed to the last farthing, and at the very first. The less we merit, the less we dare to hope, and with our doubts, mere words can never cope. We trust no goodness, please, do we perceive it? Not till the joy is ours, <coughs> can we believe it? Ah, who so little merit your esteem? I can't quite credit this 
fulfillment of my dream and shan't believe it, madame. Until I save us all. Perfectly. As soon as of your favor. <coughs> oh my! How tyrannical your love can be! And how it flusters and perplexes me! How furiously you take one's heart in hand and make your every wish a fierce command. Come, must you hound and hurry me to death? Or will you not give me time to catch my breath? Can it be right to press me with such force? Show me no quarter, give me no remorse, and take advantage by your stern insistence of the fond feelings which wake through my resistance. Well, if you look with favor upon my love, was it? Begrudge me some clear proof, Sarah. <laughs> but how can I consent without offence toward heaven, which you feel such reverence? Madame, if heaven is ours that hold you back, don't worry. I can remove that hindrance in a hurry. Nothing of that sort need obstruct our path. <clears throat> Must not one be afraid of heaven's wrath? Madame, forget such fears and be my pupil, and I shall teach you how to teach your scruples. There is a science lately formulated whereby one's actions may be liberated and any wrongful act you care to mention may be redeemed by purity of intention. Assuage my king desires, if in no dread. So sin, if any, shall be on my head. <coughs> You've a bad cop. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's bad indeed. How aggravating. <laughs> oh, more than I can say. If you're still troubled, then think of things this way. No one shall know of our joys, said Foster Lord. And it's no sin until the act is known. It's <coughs> scandal, madame, which makes it an offense. And it's no sin. Sin in confidence. Huh. Well, clearly I must do as you require and yield to your important desire. It's apparent now that nothing less will satisfy you. So I acquiesce. To go so far as much against my will, I'm vexed that it should come to this. But still, since you are so determined on it, since you will not allow me a language to convince you, and since you ask for concrete evidence, I see nothing now but to comply. If it is sinful, if I'm wrong to do it, so much more to him who drove me to it. The fault could surely not be charged to me. Madame, the fault is mine, if fault there be. Um, one minute. Um, do step out into the hall and make sure my husband is not peeking out. Why worry about the man? Each day he grows more gullible, one could lead him by the nose. And to find us here, it would fill him with delight. And if he saw the worst, he'd doubt his sight. Nevertheless, do you step out into the hall for a minute and make sure no one's in it. <laughs> that man, I must say, is a vicious beast. I'm simply stunned. I can't get over it. What? Coming out so soon? How premature. Get back in fighting and wait until you're sure. Oh, stay to the end and be convinced completely. We mustn't stop till things are proved concretely. Hell never harbored anything so vicious. Oh, tut, don't be hasty. Try to be judicious. Oh, make sure there's no mistake. No jumping to conclusions for heaven's sake. Madame! All things have worked out to perfection. I've given all the neighboring rooms a full inspection. No one's about. And now I'm at last. Hold on, my passionate fellow! <laughs> Not so fast! I should advise a little more restraint. So, you thought you'd fooled me, my dear saint. How soon you wearied of the saintly life, wedding my daughter and coveting my wife. I've long suspected you, <laughs> and had a feeling that soon I'd catch you at your double dealing. Hmm. Just now you've given me evidence galore. It's quite enough. I've no wish for more. Oh, I'm sorry to have treated you so slyly. 
But circumstances force me to be wily. Oh, brother! No more can... talk from you! Just leave this household without more ado. What I intended, that seems fairly clear. Just leave this household without the off with you. No. I'm the master, and you're the one that has to go. This house is mine, I'll have you know. Uh, <laughs> and I shall show you that you can't harm me by this contemptible conspiracy. That source who coerce me know not what they do, and that I have means to punish and expose you, O oh, dinge of indeed heaven, and make you grieve that you ever dared order me to leave. What was the point of all that angry chatter? Dear Lord, I'm worried. This is no laughing matter. How so? I fear I understood his drift. I'm much disturbed about this deed of gift. Oh, are you cave him? Yes, it's been drawn inside. But one more thing is weighing on my mind. What's that? I'll tell you. But first, let's see if there's a certain strongbox in his room upstairs. Then wait, and let's have a conference and deliberate on how this matter is to be met. That strong box has me utterly upset. This is the worst of many, many shocks. Was well, there some fearful mystery in that box? My poor friend Argus brought that box to me in utmost secrecy. It contains papers which, if they came to light, would ruin him. Or such is my impression. Then why did you let it out of your possession? Oh, those papers vexed my conscience. And it seemed best to ask the counsel of our pious guest. The cunning scoundrel got me to agree to leave the papers in his custody, so that in the case of an investigation, I could employ a slight equivocation and swear I did not have them, and thereby, at no expense to conscience, tell a lie. It seems to me as if you're out on a limb. Trusting him with that pox and offering him a teat of gift were actions of a kind which seldom indicate a prudent mind. With these two weapons, he's got the upper hand. And since you're vulnerable, as matters stand, I'm afraid you've erred once more bringing him to bay. You should have acted in some subtler way. Just think, behind that fervent face, a heart so wicked and a soul so base, I take him in, a hungry beggar, and then... Enough, my God, I'm through with pious men. Henceforth, I'll hate the whole false brotherhood and persecute them worse than Satan could. Ah, there you go, extravagant as ever. Why can you not be rational? You never take the middle course, it seems, but instead jump into an absurd extreme. You recognize your recent grave mistake in falling victim to this pious fate. But now to correct the air, must you embrace an even greater error in its place? Come, just because one rascal made you swallow a show of zeal which turned out to be hollow, must you conclude that all such men are deceivers? And that today they're no true believers? <sighs> don't seem a fraud, but also don't disperse true piety. The latter fault is worse. And it is best to err, if err one must, as you have done, upon the side of trust. Father, I hear these scoundrels utter threats against you. How he pridefully forgets how in his need was befriended by you, and uses your means to crucify you. It's true, my boy. I'm too distressed for tea. Leave it to me, sir, let me trim his ears. Ah, uh, what a display of young heart headiness. Do learn to control your fits of rage. In this just kingdom, this enlightened age, one does not settle things with violence. I hear strange tales, very strange events. Yes, strange events which these two eyes beheld. The man's in question is unparalleled. I take him in, a wretched pauper from starvation, give him gifts and treat him as a blood relation. Shower him each day with my largesse. Give him my daughter and all that I possess. Meanwhile, the unconsciousable knave induces my wife to misbehave. I'm not content with such extreme rascality. He now threatens my own liberality and aims by taking base advantage of the gifts I gave him out of Christian love to drive me from my house, a ruined man, and make me under pauper as he began. 
poor fellow. <laughs> no, my son, I'll never bring myself to think him guilty of such a thing. How's that? The righteous always from maligned. Speak clearly, mother. Say what's on your mind. I mean that I can smell a rat, my dear. You know how everyone hates him here. That has no bearing on this case at all. I told you a hundred times when you were small that virtue in this world is hatred ever. Malicious men may die, but malice never. No doubt that's true, but how does it apply? They turned you against him with a clever lie. I've told you I was there and saw it done. Ah, slanders will stop at nothing, son. Ah, oh, mother, I'll lose my temper. For the last time, I was witness to the crime. <sighs> the tongues of spice are busy right night and noon, and to their venom no man is immune. You're talking nonsense, mother. Can't you realize I saw it, saw it, saw it with my eyes? Must I shout it into your ears before you'll cease to doubt it? Appearances can deceive, my son. Dear me, we cannot always judge by what we see. Threat, threat! When often interprets things awry, good can seem evil to, to the suspicious eye. Was I to see his pawning at our meal as an act of charity? <laughs> Till his guilt is clear, a man deserves the benefit of the doubt. You should have waited to see how things turned out. Great God in heaven! Was I to sit there watching until he'd... You drive me to the brink of impropriety. No, no, a man of such a passing pride, you cannot do such a thing. You cannot shake me. I don't believe it, and you shall not make me. You vex me so that if you weren't my mother, I'd say to you, some dreadful thing or other. <laughs> it's your turn now, sir, not to listen to. You'd not trust us, and now she won't trust you. My friends, we're wasting time which should be spent in facing up to our predicament. The rascal's threats were not made in sport. Do you think he'd have the nerve to go to court? I'm sure he won't. They'd find it all too crude, a case of swindling and ingratitude. I wouldn't be too sure. He won't be at a loss to give his claims a high and righteous gloss. And clever rogues with far less cause have trapped their victims in a web of laws. Again, I say to antagonize a man so strong in the arm was most unwise. I knew it, but the man's appalling cheek out raged me so. I couldn't control my peak. I pray to heaven that we could devise some truce between you or some compromise. If I had known what cards he held, I'd not have roused his anger by my little plot. What is that man doing here? Who is he? Go talk to him and tell him that I'm busy. Good day, dear sister. Please show me to your master. He's involved with company and he cannot be disturbed just now, I fear. I hate to intrude, but what has brought me here will not disturb your master in any event. In fact, my news will make him most content. Your name? Just tell him I bring greetings from Monsieur Laya and Monsieur Tartuffe. Sir, he's a very gracious man and declares that he bears a message from Tartuffe. Upon my word, I say this man must be seen and heard. Perhaps he has some settlement to suggest. How should I treat him? What manner would be best? Control your anger. And if he should mention some fair adjustment, give him your full attention. Good help to you, good son. May heaven confound your enemies and may your joys abound. A gentle salutation. It confirms my guess that he's here to offer terms. I've always held your family most dear. In fact, sir, I've served your father for many a year. I must ask your pardon. To my shame, I cannot now recall your face or name. Loyal is my name. I come from Normandy, and I'm a bailiff in all modesty. For forty years, praise God, it's been my boast to serve with honor in that vital post. And I am here, sir, if you'll permit the liberty, to serve you with these writ. To what? Please, sir, let us have no friction. It is nothing but an order of eviction. You are to move your goods and family out and make way for new occupants without the formal delay and give the keys. I leave this house? Why, yes, sir, if you please. This house, sir, from cellar to the roof, belongs now to good Monsieur Tartuffe. He is lord and master of your estate. By deed of uh, virtue, bring on due form of the clearest legal phrasing. Your insolence is utterly amazing. Young man, my business here is not with you, but with your wise and temperate father, who, like any worthy citizen, stands in awe of justice and would never but the law. Not for a million, sir! <sighs> would you rebel his authority? I know that well. You will not make trouble, sir, or interfere in the execution of my duties here. Someone may execute a smart tattoo on that black cape of yours before you're through. Sir, I bid your son be silent. I much regret having to mention such a nasty threat in writing my report. 
It's a man in my house, the most disloyal sort. I love all men of upright character, and when I agreed to serve these papers, sir, it was your feelings that I had in mind. I couldn't bear to see the case assigned to someone who might esteem you less and subject you to unpleasantness. What could be more unpleasant than telling a man to leave his house and home? You'd like a short reprieve, sir? If you desire it, I shall not press you, but wait till tomorrow to dispossess you. <laughs> but bright and early, you must be quick, and remove all your furniture, every stick. The men of hire both young and strong, and with their help it shall not take you long. In the short, I make things pleasant and convenient, and since I'm being so extremely lenient, please show me a like consideration and offer me your full cooperation. <sighs> I may be all bankrupt, but I vow I'll give a thousand louis here and now, just for the pleasure of landing one good clout. Right on the end of that complacent snout. Careful, <laughs> don't make things worse. My boot all it is to give that beggar a kick in the britches. Monsieur, uh, I'd love to hear the sound of a swipe across your fine card back. Take care, woman, too. May go to jail if she uses threatening language against the bailiff. Enough, enough. This must not go on. Give me that table, sir, and this, please, be gone. Well, au revoir. May God give you all good cheer. May God confound you and him who sent you here. <sighs> now, mother, was I right or not? This witch should change your notion of tartuffe for me. I'm thunderstruck. I must leave aghast. Oh, come, be fair. You mustn't take offense at this new proof of his benevolence. He's actually out of selfless love, I know. Material things enslave the soul. And so he's kindly arranged your liberation from all that might endanger your salvation. Will you not ever hold your tongue, you dunce? Come, some <gasps> action must be taken, and at once. Go tell the world of the low trick he is trying. The deed of the gift is surely nullified by such behavior. His public rage will not permit the wretch to carry out his plot. Sir, though I hate to bring you more bad news, such is the danger that I cannot choose. A friend who is very close to me and knows my interest in your family has just sent me word that you in plight can which your one salvation lies in flight. That scoundrel who opposed upon you so denounced you to the king an hour ago, and as supporting evidence displayed a strong box of certain renegades, the secret papers so we testified you disloyally agreed to hide. I don't know just... <clears throat> I don't... I don't know just... Tartuffe has been instructed furthermore to guide the arresting officer to your door. He's clearly done this to facilitate the taker over you, your house, and your state. That man, I must say, is a vicious beast! Quick, sir, you mustn't tarry in the least. My carriage is outside to take you hence. This ten thousand louis should cover all expense. I'll go with you all the way. I'll place you in a safe refuge to which they'll never trace you. Ah, oh, my boy, I wish I could repay you for the gratitude which we all owe you. But now is not the time. I pray the Lord that I may live to give you your reward. Farewell, my dears. I'm off. In the name of the king. Brother Harris, take care of things here. You need to worry. Chiefly, sir, chiefly. Stay right with you. Ah. No need for haste. Your lodging isn't far. You're off to prison by order of the prince. This is the crowning blow, you wretch. And since it means my total ruin and defeat, your villainy is now at last complete. You needn't try to provoke me. It's no use. It's all who serve heaven must expect abuse. You are indeed most patient, sweet, and blameless. How he exploits the name of heaven! It's shameless! Your hunts and muckeries are all for naught. To do my duty is my only sort. Your love of duty is most meritorious. But what you have done is little short of glory. All oh, deeds are glorious, madame, which obeys a sovereign prince who sent me here today. I rescued you when you were destitute. Have you forgotten that, you thankless brute? No, no. I will remember everything. But my first duty is to the king. That obligation is so paramount that others beside it do not count. And for it, I would gladly give my wife, my family, my friend, oh my wife, left. Hypocrite! All that we most revere, he uses a cloak as cloth and camouflage his bruises. If it's true that you are animated by pure and loyal zeals you've stated, 
Why weren't you moved to give your evidence until after your outraged host had driven you hence? And if he's a traitor, as you declare, how can you condescend to make him your heir? Sir, spare me this plumber. He's a grown swill. Carry out your orders, if you will. Yes, I have delayed too long, sir. Thank you kindly. You're the proper person to remind me. Come, you're off to the other borders in the king's prison, according to his orders. Who? Ah, sir? Yes. But this cannot be true. I owe an explanation, but not to you. Sir, all is well. Rest easy and be grateful. We serve a prince to whom all sham is hateful. A prince who sees into our innermost hearts and cannot be, pr cannot be choosed by a hater's arts. With one keen glance, the king recognized Tartuffe as one notorious by another name. We'd done so many vicious crimes that one could fill ten volumes with them and be writing still. But to be brief, our sovereign was appalled by this man's treachery towards you, which he called the last, worst villainy of his vile career, and bade us to follow him here to see how gross his impudence could be and force him to restore your property. Your private papers by the king's command I hereby seize and give into your hand. The king, by royal order, invalidates the deed which gave this rascal your estates, and furthermore gave this unto you. Heaven be praised! I breathe again at last. Oh, we're safe. I can't believe the date is past. Well, traitor, now you see! Our brother, please, let's not descend to such indignities. Leave the poor wretch to his unhappy fate, and don't say anything else which might aggravate his present woes. No, rather hope that he will soon embrace a true piety, and mend his ways through a true repentance, move his king to moderate his sentence. In the meantime, kneel before your sovereign's throne, and thank him for the mercies he's shown. Well said. Let's go at once and gladly, Neely, express the gratitude which we are all feeling, and once that first great duty's been done, we'll turn our pleasures to a second one and give Valer, whose love has proven so true, the wedded happiness which is his due.